now have Mara Gordon from the organization on cell deaths to treat patients with medicinal cannabis. They help patients create more efficient dosage plans and to customize treatment with cannabis ex extract. Her presentation is on practical applications of cannabinoids in chronic conditions. Welcome. Okay, so we're going to be talking about a very dry topic today, but one that many of you are here about, and that is how do you actually do this for your particular loved one's diseases? So the first thing I want to look at here, very, very quickly going to go over, the endocannabinoid system, which is simply the cannabinoids that are in, inside of our body itself. As uh, Zach went over so much before, we have the, the discovery of anandamide and 2-AG, and there's a uh, possibility of a third orphan receptor, which is known as GBR55. Um, these are the ones that are involved in uh, establishing homeostasis within our bodies and, and allowing us to have the benefits of cannabis as it works through our bodies, through the different cannabinoids. Next, we have phyto or exocannabinoids, and all that means is the same thing that we have in our body that comes from the outside, and that is plant-based cannabinoids, and the most common ones that we know uh, that come from uh, cannabis is the most. Another one, uh, inc incidentally, is you have, uh, I don't know if it would technically be a phytocannabinoid, but you have something called beta carophylline, which is found in black pepper and other sources, and it also activates the CB2 receptor sites. So it's not just cannabis, though it is the main one that we know about. The two primary that we get the most uh, um, press and that most people are familiar with is the THC, which is the one that causes some of the psychoactivity, but that's a side benefit of all the health benefits that it's creating within your body. Then, of course, cannabidiol, which is CBD, the least less that has no... Um, uh, um, reported psychoactivity. It is reported of some people having um, higher levels of anxiety or sleepiness with it, and whether you call those psychoactive or not, I guess is a matter of opinion. Um, okay, now, I want to talk just very, very high level about what a terpene is. A terpene is something that you smell. When you, when, you, when you pick up a lemon and you smell it, that's a terpene. When you, when you go up and you smell a rose, that's a terpene. Or it's, a, it's a bunch of terpenes. And the same thing with lavender and many, many others. In uh, cannabis, it's very important, the terpenes, because they're involved in something that we call the entourage effect. In other words, when they come together, they are greater than the sum of their parts. When you take different terpenes and different cannabinoids and you mix them together, you have a very, very different effect than you would from an isolated uh, cannabinoid. Uh, for example, alpha-pinene is one that is found in um, pine trees and some other things. And as it said here, it has anti-inflammatory, bronchial dilator, AIDS memory, and is an antibacterial. It also can create extreme anxiety in some people. So you have to be careful which strains that have which terpenes that you use for which disorders, because all strains are not made alike. Also, of course, we're uh, familiar with uh, uh, limonene, which is that uplifting. It's good for acid reflux. Uh, anxiety, depression, and it's very, very uplifting. Myrcene, which I'll go to the next slide to show you. Myrcene and limonene. Myrcene is, um, is, has a sedative effect. Now, I don't know if in Costa Rica, if you have it, we, have, we call it like the, the old hippie trick of eating a mango 20 to 30 minutes before you um, uh, medicate with your cannabis and you'll have, you'll, they say you'll get higher. Well, what's really happening is it increases the absorption of the cannabinoids into your body and the myrcene within it, which is very, very high levels in mangoes, has a very somnolent, very relaxing effect. So you see that in a lot of, you'll find the myrcene in a lot of your indica type strains, which are your more sleepy strains. We'll go to that in a minute though. Okay, so what is a cannabis strain? Let me, here we go, okay. 
Um, instead of me going through what the 5,700 strains are, I just want to uh, state that the land race strains, there's approximately 100 of these strains of cannabis that have been growing throughout the world since before recorded time. Um, they're, they're throughout the world. You have them in Afghani regions. You have them in, in the Asia. You have them in South America. You have them here. You have them a lot in Africa. Um, you have uh, many of I've talked to somebody earlier today about Northern Lights, and Northern Lights is a land race strain. In other words, it didn't, it's not a mixture from anything, it just is because it is. And um, uh, it's from, I believe it's from British Columbia. Now, you have the, of those 5,700 strains that are out there now, the vast majority of those are hybrids. They're a mixture from a, uh, a two or more strains put together. There's a really good source on um, the internet. Uh, it's called seedfinder.eu. So if any of you are interested in doing some research on the genetic background and understanding what the strains are, because the names can be very, very confusing and they really don't give you very much information unless you know the histor history behind what the strains are. Now at the bottom here, I'm showing, uh, let's see, here. This is a sativa leaf and this is an indica leaf. And so, you know, they look very different and um, they are very different, but what the sativa traditionally has a more um, intense, uh, uplifting daytime, and that's used, those strains are used quite a bit with PTSD, ADHD, um, Tourette's, uh, some autism, things like that. Uh, whereas the uh, indica strains are the ones that we usually go to for uh, serious chronic such or serious diseases such as uh, cancers and chronic pain, sleep disorders, things like that. So here's what we just were talking about with the indica and the sativa. Now, um, I'm <laughs> following after Dr. Sanchez. I don't think I'm going to talk to you too much about how it works. I think she's taking care of that a little bit better than I can. But basically what I want to make clear here is that the purpose of the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites that we understand and the purpose of the endocannabinoid system and the activation in our body is to achieve homeostasis. And when you have a homostatic environment, things are working together synchronistically the way they're supposed to. When you have disease present, you have a lack of homeostasis. Um, so the, the part of what's actually happening is they will go, the receptor sites, when they're active, they will, they will do almost what they have to do and transform into the system in your body in order to be the most effective at, to uh, create the result because they're going to do what they have to do to get this balance back into your body. The THC has more mechanisms of action in medical application. And if the one thing that I leave you with at the end of all of this is that THC, without THC, you're leaving the vast majority of, of uh, diagnoses and diseases and most sick people without treatment. And I know that there's this big trend towards CBD only and people are somehow freaked out about the side benefit of psychoactivity, but I still don't understand why euphoria and happiness is listed as a negative side effect. Uh, so. Thank you. Now, THCA is also an extremely important for medicinal benefits. Um, and THC is an anti-inflammatory, anti-prolific, and, and anti-epileptic. Anti uh, we treat a lot of, of people that have um, seizure disorders, sometimes from epilepsy, sometimes as a result of glioblastomas or other brain tumors, or even metastatic cancers that have gone to the brain from other parts of the body. And THCA is a very, very effective and very powerful tool in your cannabis toolbox. Um, that is what is found in the raw cannabis before it is heated. The term uh, decarboxylate, uh, de to decarboxylate the cannabis is to drop off the acid molecule, and so then it's the right size to fit in to do all of its little activation of its receptor sites. But when it's in its raw form, it has a very, very different um, uh, set of, of, of properties, and what it can do is very uh, powerful. In fact, with, uh, frequently with epilepsy, 
uh, where CBD maybe works for a while or stops working, THCA might be what's needed in its place. And in all those cases, and I'll get to that later, you still have to have a little bit of THC. Without going through all these, CBD, of course, is being studied uh, as an antipsychotic, anti-epileptic, and proven to have extreme anti-inflammatory. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool, uh, CBD, for inflammation and uh, to assist in pain, and also in um, uh, keeping cancer cells from coming back. So once you have somebody into remission, you can put them to a very low uh, THC dose by increase the CBD uh, quite a bit in that, and then they can go on with their regular life without having the uh, psychoactivity that may or may not make them feel uncomfortable. Okay, so there's a couple of factoids here. I mean, there's a lot of, of I think there's like a hundred almost, or about a hundred different cannabinoids, and they're being discovered. I think Justin Kander mentioned that they just discovered seven new. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a moving target. Um, uh, just like we didn't know decades ago that the even THC even existed, now we know that there's quite a few more. In addition, there's about the 500, uh, I hear, I've heard between 200 and 500, but somewhere in there, of a uh, number of different terpenes. Of course, when the terpenes are combined or combined with the cannabinoids, they become terpenoids, and then they have different uh, properties altogether, but that's another talk. So, okay. Um, this is just a graphic that you can find on the internet that's all over the place. That's, that's a, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a way of looking at to see where this, the receptor sites are actually distributed within the body. The CB1 receptor sites are primarily in the central nervous system. The CB2 receptor sites are more in the lymphatic system. Um, however, uh, when diseases occur, there tends to be these, the, the receptor sites will appear wherever they're needed. Um, <clears throat> okay. Here's another version of the apoptosis uh, chemical cascade that occurs when the receptor sites are activated. I think I'm going to have to ask Dr. Sanchez for a copy of hers. I liked it better. <laughs> but what's happening is um, the, we, we know this from the evidence, we know this from the research, that when the CBD, uh, or C, excuse me, the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites are activated, that it does cause this resulting in the program cell death or cell suicide, otherwise known as apoptosis. So, I'm, um, and then uh, Dr. Sean McAllister has been doing quite a bit of research into the ID1 gene, which is in certain cancers, uh, for example, in the uh, brain, liver, lung, skin, thyroid, gland, other places where these ID1 genes seem to be present in these different cancers, they find that using cannabidiol, it somehow acts as a, it restricts the translation of the ID1 gene, and the ID1 gene is responsible for metastasis and uh, cell growth. So by blocking the ID1 gene, you block it. So it, it, it work, has a very different way of working. It doesn't work directly on a, a cannabinoid receptor site. Instead, it works on, by the way, it blocks another system in the body that's not going to do something negative. Okay, let me go back. Let me say here. And these, can, these cancers right now at the bottom that are listed here, um, I don't know if you can see them all. If not, I'm happy to show later. Um, there's uh, lung cancer, breast, gastric, uh, glioblastoma, melanoma. These are ones where there is ID1 gene presence and that we've started to do some treatment protocols that we're experimenting with very successfully with using a combination of the higher CBD and the lower THC versus some of the other models that we have in our traditional cancer protocols. Okay, now, on glioblastoma, and these are all glioblastoma multiform, GBMs, this is a uh, set of patients that we have been treating um, successfully, and, and I want to just mention very, very briefly what success means. Because when you're in uh, a, an environment where you're dealing with people that have been given, you know, basically sent home to die, which unfortunately, because of the legalities and the cultural stigmas associated with cannabis, a lot of times people don't come to us until they're at, you know, a Hail Mary pass where they're just, it's the last thing. They've been sent home to die and they have nothing to lose. The truth of the matter is they should have gone to this first because then they wouldn't have been in that place to begin with. Thank you. Now, I also see a lot of the drug studies that are going on in the cannabis uh, world where they're, they're looking for that one magic dose 
or, or the way to be able to dose it with milligrams per kilogram of weight. And I can tell you from our, uh, our clinical research and our actual real world application, there is not a correlation between weight and dose. It has, it's a closer correlation on age. Um, the younger the patient, the higher the dose required. The older the patient, the low. As you can see here, I've got a three-year-old patient who's using 400 milligrams per day of THC and 350 milligrams a day of CBD. And in this case, the uh, THC is uh, Candyland, which is a really beautiful indica hybrid. The THC, excuse me, the CBD strain is ACDC, which is one that we use um, almost exclusively. We use Valentin X also, which is really the same thing, just somebody put a different name on it. But ACDC has been stabilized and it's predictable. And each time we get it, it comes pretty much the same. And that's what we're always looking for, is repeatability. Because this is a whole plant, and when you're dealing with the whole plant, you, and it's being grown in an environment where, depending on how close it is to the light, or where it is on the hill, or where the, whether the fan blows on it, it can completely change the chemical outcome of what that plant will be. Where the three-year-old was on 430 and 350, and the 88-year-old was only on 75 and 30. Now, 75 milligrams of, of sounds like very, very little when you look at this in regards to the female. But if anybody that's familiar with Marinol, uh, the synthetic uh, cannabinoid of THC, um, I know it has other names, Drabinol and all these other ones as well, but Marinol is the one that I used to use. Um, it is a synthetic and an isolated THC, and it comes in 2.5, 5, and 10 milligrams. And 2.5 milligrams is too much for some people. So if you have somebody, if you think about it, those terms, think about how little that is. And if you have somebody who's on 75 milligrams, that would knock most of the people in this room right on your bottoms. That is a lot of THC. When you take a puff and you smoke, you're, not, you're getting maybe 10% of that maximum, okay? So I think that's important for people to realize is it's, uh, uh, more isn't always better and uh, the, the age is very what's important here. Same thing here now here with the breast cancers. We had, uh, the, these were, let me just verify. I believe that the, the second one, the 47-year-old female here, here, that she was triple negative, which means that she was not hormone receptive and we were looking at using a higher CBD with her and a lower THC, or in her case, it ended up being one-to-one, -one. but I believe that she was the one that we had on the 100 to 100, and uh, if we had anything higher than that, she couldn't, uh, couldn't handle it, absolutely could not handle it. And frankly, when you're titrating or when you're increasing your dose with a, with a patient or with yourself or whomever your, your loved one is, you want to start very, very low, and you want to increase very slowly because everybody's system is different. And everybody's going to have that dose that's the correct dose for them at a different place. You know, I've, I've uh, came when I first, before I came into this 35 years ago, I started studying about uh, alternative uh, treatments for cancers. And I looked at Linus Pauling's studies and the way that he titrated patients up on his vitamin C. And I kind of took that as a guide, not that everyone's going to have loose bowels as a result of THC the way they do with vitamin C, but as fact that everybody will in fact have their own level and what the level. So there isn't a standardization of a particular dose that's going to fit everybody, not even close. Now these two lower, these two bottom ones were women that were looking for, um, uh, uh, we had them on a maintenance dose, and you'll see very, very different. The 35-year-old was what we call a super sensitive, and she's an example of somebody who cannot get up. That is a therapeutic dose for her. Anything higher in life is so unbearable that she has no quality of life. And it's very important when asking uh, a patient, what is it there, to look, what, what, are you, what is your goal? What is your objective with cannabis? Are you looking to alleviate the side effects of your traditional Western like uh, 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 medicine, like chemotherapies? Or are you looking 
to actually kill the cancer cells. Because if you are, we'll roll our sleeves up and we'll get busy and we'll do it. But otherwise, we'll just get you to comfortable. And that's, for many, many people, that's enough. Now, the actions in epilepsy of THC is that an activation of the CB1 receptors that shorts out the calcium ion pump on the presynaptic neuron. This, who cares, right, <laughs> this meat here. But the potential is that it stops uh, grand mal seizures and it has a hydrocortisone-like anti-inflammatory benefit. Same thing with the CBD. It's CBD is 30 to 50 times stronger than, um, than uh, hydrocortisone which is, uh, as an anti-inflammatory, makes it invaluable, and it reduces it. We do, it's also a neuroprotectant, so that it, when these uh, uh, epileptic patients are having their seizures, it's protecting the brain from not being damaged as a result of the seizure. THCA has also been found, as I mentioned earlier, to work beautifully along with or in place of the CBD. Um, epilep epilepsy is the most complicated thing that I've ever tried to approach because epilepsy is a, is a catch-all diagnosis for seizure activity. And why the person is having a seizure is, makes all the difference in the world about you know, where in the brain it's happening, was it coming from somewhere else. A lot of times you have epileptics where you have uh, gastrointestinal issues that if you help with that, and the THCA does beautiful with that, then it reduces the seizure activity on, uh, just by fixing the gut. Uh, it's important to talk about diet. It's important to talk about a spiritual basis, whether that's just whether you do meditation, whether you have a spiritual, because all healing is mind, body, spirit. It doesn't occur in a vacuum. So, oh, let me go back here. So in this case, this is an example at the bottom of a seven-year-old female that we were treating with 250 milligrams of ACDC, and in that 250 milligrams, there was 10.3 milligrams of THC. Now, that's very important because when I see these CBD-only laws, and they talk about having THC below 0 0.003 or 0 0.01 or all these ridiculous numbers, there's not going to be enough THC in that medicine that results from that hemp to be able to treat these diseases effectively. There has to be these small doses of THC as well. Hemp is wonderful. I think we should save the world with it, but we should leave the cannabis to the medicine. Now, intractable nerve pain is the next that I want to look at. And this is really, you know, anybody who has sciatic nerve pain, has hurt their back, has a recurrence from an old injury or anything, this really kind of applies to you. Now, I, 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 I borrowed this directly out of uh, Dr. Dustin Sulak from Integrated Health in Maine, brilliant researcher and doctor. He's doing some phenomenal work there uh, with patients in Maine back in the United States. He just spoke last week at Patients Out of Time or two weeks ago, and he mentioned the five mechanisms uh, that involved in the pain reduction of the CB1 and CB2 activation by THC. So what's actually happening? What's the THC actually doing when you ingest it or when you take it or when you smoke it or however you get it into your body? It retards the electrochemical reactions at the peripheral pain receptors. It interrupts the pain signal at the dorsal root ganglion. It interrupts the pain signal at the neuron, and it activates the CB2 leukocyte, provides major anti-inflammatory response. It also has, and this is, let's not, it also has psychoactive euphoric effects and short-term memory reduction, which reduce stress response to pain. So when a person's in pain, having some freedom from that is not a bad thing. Sometimes just, you know, that the psychoactive is the best part of it for pain relief. Because if you have the correct dose, you do not have to be altered in such a way that you feel like you cannot be fully functional as a human being. That is not a correct dose. That's a recreational dose. That's sitting in the evening with your friends and enjoying yourself and, and smoking a bowl or whatever it is you want to do. But when you're talking about medicine and you're talking about cannabis as a medicine, you do not, it is not required that you become completely silly and stupid. You just have to become, get to the point where you have, you have achieved your goal, in this case, alleviating pain and reducing the stress and tension associated with that. That doesn't mean that you're loopy. It just means you're not in pain anymore. 
In this particular patient, this was a 78-year-old uh, woman, and I had her on a combination of THCA, THC, and CBD. And now one thing I want to show you in my next slide, and I apologize, I don't think you're going to be able to see it um, very well, is um, how we achieved that. Here was the first medication that we gave her. It was called Swiss Gold. It's a, high, it's a higher CBD strain. In this case, it was 0.69%, uh, six, or in other words, there was 6.9 milligrams of CBD uh, per mil and 0.07 or 0.7 milligrams of THC per mil. Um, in this case, the uh, milligrams in, in uh, milliliter, or the grams in milliliters are pretty much interchangeable. So we were, here's the dose that we were giving. We had her on a, an initial target dose of 15 milligrams of CBD. Now keep in mind, she's 78 years old. Okay, so we had her on that, and then we had her taking that through three doses a day, in other words, five milligrams three times a day, and through that, she, re she was able to get an additional 1.5 milligrams of THC. We also wanted her on the THC, and that was from another strain that we had created. Same thing, THCA, we wanted her on 15 milligrams of that is the toast, uh, uh, target dose, she received 3.8 milligrams of residual THC that was in with the THCA. And as a result, once I look all this together, a bunch, bunch of math, and I'll just read to you, um, she ended up having 15 milligrams of each of those as we required, and she had a total of 5.3 milligrams of uh, activated THC. And she was a very, very happy woman. She reported that she hadn't slept in uh, over 25 years, um, more than a couple of hours, and only at the most exhausted point of the night previously, and now she's sleeping like a baby. So um, now I'm looking at insomnia. Insomnia um, is uh, THC. This is how it works for that. The ind more of the indica dominant strains, as we talked about before, because of the myrcene, the mango, the myrcene in there. Um, also, um, there is less of an op opportunity that there's going to be alpha pinene or lemonine and things like that, that you want to look for strains that don't. If they have lemon in the name, use them for daytime. If they don't use that at nighttime because it might keep you up. Also, we don't recommend um, uh, sativas in general for night unless we're dealing with, like I said before, PTSD, things like that. The THC activates the CB1 receptors um, and the CB2, and then it also has the anxiety, which can, it slows down the neural responses, it slows everything down, and it also creates um, a sense of ease. The CBD mechanism of action, we don't really understand exactly because some people it makes uh, a very awake as well as some people making it sleepy. In this case, we were treating a 60-year-old gentleman and uh, he was on uh, a strain of called Granddaddy Purple, and he was, which by the way is one of my favorite, favorite strains. The same way I say don't <laughs> use lemon during at night. Uh, don't use the purples, not much during the day unless you know what you're doing, but you want to go to the purple strains for, and now purple is something that happens from cold, but there's a group of names of strains like Grape Ape, Purple Urkel, um, uh, uh, granddaddy purple, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of them out there. And if you look at the genetics back on seedfinder.eu, you'll see that most of them come from the same genetics. Um, some people say Brett Bogue, some say Ken Estes. I'm just staying neutral and just saying I like them. So anyway, so this gentleman was on 25 milligrams of THC and no CBD at bedtime because in his case it did give him, uh, it made him too hyperactive. Now, hypertension is very controversial because it works for some and it doesn't work for others, and we still don't know exactly why. Um, we know that it causes the vasodilation of blood vessels, and it lowers the blood pressure through that. Um, it also obviously releases uh, stress and blocks the production of the acetylcholine and, blocks the, and, and uh, slows down the neuroactivity at the synaptic cleft. Uh, we have a 57-year-old male who came to us um, about to have to go on disability from his job. And his job was sitting at a desk. He was a computer uh, programmer. 
but his hypertension was so severe that he was going, he was, his doctors were recommending that he become uh, fully disabled and not work again. We started him on uh, 30 milligrams of THC, 13 milligrams as a result because of what was in the strain of, of uh, CBD, and this was in an infused olive oil. Now I'm going to show you here how we accomplish this. The very first strain he tried was called Cotton Candy Diesel over here. And let me, let me um, stress at this point, the reason we know so much about our medicine is because we have everything tested. We test the flowers, we test the infused oils, we test the extract, and we test each and every batch. We don't just do it once out of the, out of the flowers and think that we can know forward for the rest. Every time we do it, even though we do it the same way every time, we still retest it because there could be one degree temperature difference, maybe the wind was blowing, maybe the humidity was different, whatever it is, we want to make sure so that we can get, collect this research and get this data to do a better job of predicting what's going to work for each and every person. So when I say we know that it was 5.3 milligrams, we know that because we literally weigh the medicine down to the 0 .001 and to know exactly what's in it after we get our lab results. Um, in this case, he started out with the cotton candy diesel. We had 30 milligrams of THC is his goal. And because of the chemical makeup of that strain, so he's supposed to be getting uh, the 13 milligrams of uh, CBD along with the THC. Now, after we had run out of the cotton candy, we didn't have any more, and we couldn't get any more. And so we had to go to recreating the, uh, uh, the medicine that he was taking by combining two other strains. You can compound it. When you know what's in them, you can mix them to create the, the response you're looking for. If you remember, we had, we had 30 and, and 13, so we were trying to get as close as we could, but also selecting strains that had the same properties in the lab results, the terpene profiles, the cannabinoid ratios, all of the things that were in the cotton candy diesel we needed to recreate in whatever this other mixture so that he would have a, a, a relatively consistent and seamless experience so that he would have predictability and know when he took his medicine each day how it was in fact going to affect him. So once we had the, let's see, okay. Once we had the cookies and the ACDC here, we were able to um, get the 30 milligrams, and the closest we got on that was 15 milligrams, and um, which was good enough. The two milligrams difference in his case on the CBD, CBD isn't going to, two milligrams is not going to make a difference one way or the other when you're dealing with something at this low of a level with um, a relatively healthy man, except for the hypertension. And then the Pepe Le Pew in the Swiss Gold, the next time we had to reproduce this effect, the, we had very similar between the Pepe Le Pew and the cookies on their profile, but the, the, and the Swiss gold was very similar to the ACDC. And we were able to reproduce this where he once again was getting 30 milligrams of THC and 15 of CBD. Okay. So next is how it works. Uh, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, the, C the THC, once vented, activates the CBD, uh, CB1 and CB2 receptor sites in the gut, and it relieves the motility, inhibits secretions, causing inflammation. Uh, so that makes this, everything in your stomach just work better. I also would say that you should include THCA in any protocol that's for Crohn's or irritable bowel, which is the raw, once again. The CBD reduces the inflammation and reduces a lot of the symptoms. It also has antibacterial effects, which is very important because of the uh, opportunistic infections that are often present in people that have chronic um, uh, uh, gastrointestinal issues. We were treating a 54-year-old female with 30 milligrams of THC and 15 milligrams of CBD, and she was also vaporizing um, cannabis uh, oil and flowers for breakthrough symptoms. Now, the ones that were at the very low doses, when they're when they're um, we try to standardize our, our, our infused olive oils around 10 milligrams per mil, per milliliter. We have a thing that as long as somebody is below um, like uh, 40 or 50 milligrams a day, 
there's no point in them working with the extracts because the extracts are very difficult. Those are the concentrated oils that people hear about, the RSO, the Rick Simpson oils, the... Um, uh, anyway, well, and what those are is those are where you've taken a lot of cannabis and you've, uh, you've uh, extracted it down to a concentration, you know, sometimes as high as, you know, over 80% of a major cannabinoid. If you're dealing with 800 milligrams, let's say, or 700 milligrams of THC in one gram of oil, how are you going to get five milligrams out of that and be accurate? You're off a little dot. You might be giving them an extra 20 milligrams and not even know what you're doing. So in that case, we recommend that the cannabis is made in an infused olive oil you don't want to use a tincture where it's, where it's alcohol or glycerin because you don't want to introduce the sugars, especially when you're dealing with cancers or any kind of a bowel disorders because nutrition, like I said before, remember, is a very, very important part of this. So in this case, she was very successfully and has been very successfully treated with this now for several years, um, and we're very, very proud of those results. Now, PTSD, ADHD, Tourette's. Um, it blocks the production of the acetylcholine, and it's a sh which blocks the short-term memory neurotransmitter. Now, one of the things that many people complain about with cannabis is the fact that they walk in a room and they can't remember why they walked in there, or they start a sentence and they can't get to the end. And that is because of this blessed, wonderful, beautiful ability to have your short-term memory interrupted by the THC. And if you have PTSD and you're, you're reliving things over and over and over again and you're in a constant state of fight or flight, then you want to have that interrupted because you want to be able to create a state of homeostasis. And you can't do that if you're constantly in a fight or flight. So having the interruption of the short-term memory is a positive thing, and that's what allows people to have more focus. Um, now, there is a supplement called citicoline. And it is available, you can order it online and start out with 250 milligrams and you can go as high as 2,000. Nothing will, it doesn't have any negative side effects and it actually replaces what is diminished from this so that if this isn't your issue or if you're on, if somebody you love is on it for at a very high dose for cancer treatments or chronic pain and they just it's the difference between success and failure, them feeling like they're not paranoid and like they don't understand what's happening around them. Introduce the citicoline and it might make a difference in their success. In this case, this was a, uh, a woman that came to us with, with PTSD. She also, she didn't actually come with PTSD, she came with fibromyalgia. And she came with a whole, once we did a patient intake on her, the myriad of disease and diagnosis and mistreatment by doctors. She'd been to every doctor for everything. They told her she had Lyme disease, and then they told her fibromyalgia, and then they told her this, and they told her that. After we started interviewing whatever, um, um, I didn't say anything to her at first because I didn't know what her response. I just said, what happened to you in such and such, and gave her a year. She started telling me what was going on in her life, and it was very, very clear that she was dealing with PTSD. She was also very, very hypersensitive because sometimes we find that some of the people that are being treated with, uh, by the time they're looking to cannabis and they've been through, you know, the hell known as the medical uh, life cycle, they've, they've, um, they almost have a hyper awareness of their bodies and they're too tuned in, um, and they tend to be more sensitive. And as a result, we are able to give, have higher success by using a much, much lower dose. If they start feeling uncomfortable they'll quit. So you've got to be very conscious of that when you're dosing. At 15 milligrams of THC and 5 milligrams of CBD, she was able to successfully um, go about with her life and be doing very, very well, which is wonderful. Now the last thing I just hear is in my conclusions, um, I just want to say that cannabis is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, you have to have the whole plant, not just isolated. They all work together. The endo and exocannabinoids play a significant part in all diseases. Um, it's important to select the right strains. If you select the wrong strains, nothing bad is going to happen, but you're not going to feel as good. You're going you're to have less chance of having success if you don't have the right strains. Plus the fact that because the entourage effect is so important in the treatment of disease, if the closer you can get to getting it right, you don't have to take as high of a dose to achieve the same results. Um, 
it is possible to dose correctly and consistently. Um, it is, you know, if once you lab, if you have lab tested medicine by a reliable lab that's using state of the art machinery and knows what they do and they have trained technicians and you know what's in your medicine, you can do it over and over again, even if you have to use actually different medicines to achieve the same results. We can create individualized treatment plans. Your doctors can work with you to do this. Hopefully they'll be educated at some point to be able to do it. Separating the THC and the CBD doses also greatly influences the, the results. Instead of having them together in the same plant, in some cases you can. In some cases you can put the medicines together. But in most cases, you're able to keep your doses far lower when you separate out, um, not separate them out from the plant as in an isolate, but when you separate a high THC strain from a high CBD strain. And then um, all cannabis must be lab tested. I mean, that's just, as far as I'm concerned, to not lab, your te lab test for, you know, forget heavy metals and uh, pesticides and all those things. Those are for take for granted. Of course we need to know if those things are in there. But to not know what you're taking in your medicine itself, to not know if it, how it's going to make you feel, um, I'm not willing to live in those circumstances, and I'm a patient myself. I want to know what's in my medicine, and I, know ex I want to know exactly how I'm going to respond and I want to know how much I can take so that I don't have any surprises. My biggest complaint about um, edibles is the lack of predictability in, 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 the, in the inaccuracy in the dosing. If you know what you're taking and you know how it's going to affect you, you can plan your life. You can just have a life, and this is just one of your medicines. And then the most important conclusion here is that without THC, most diseases would not be treatable with cannabis. And to not include THC in the discussion is to leave the vast majority of the population sick with no hope. Thank you.